1 Samuel chapter number 13 and verse number 19. Now there was no smith, everybody say blacksmith, found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, least these Hebrews take them or make them swords and spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his culture, his axe and his mattock. Yet they, uh, yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the cultures and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and Jonathan his son was there found. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. I want to stop reading right there. How many does that make sense to this morning? I didn't think so. It will when I get done. Amen. Y'all can be seated in the house of God. I want to preach this morning on a a message that I want to title, The Sword of the Word of God. Is that all right? The Sword of the Word of God. How many knows this morning that the church today emphasizes a great uh, different many of uh, programs, methods, or approaches. I mean, we're, we're living in a modern day that now we're trying to uh, proclaim the gospel through things besides the preaching of the gospel. Are y'all with me? I mean, uh, we've got now in our modern day small group activities, we've got uh, small group sharing, we've got culturally relevant. How many knows we're coming out with new Bibles that are culturally relevant? We're coming up with churches that have a uh, conservative type of service and the older people that are more conservative can come out for the early morning service and then they'll have a later service for uh, more contemporary worship service. Uh, They'll have tradition worship services. They emphasize on modern day music compared to old type, old style music. And even in the church you're sitting in right now, we try our best to reach back and grab some of the old style hymnals and do some southern gospel and then do some praise and worship. And it's not really for God's sake, it's really for our sake uh, trying to encapture people and make them want to come to our church. Uh, Even in our modern day, we're going under secular psychology. We're preaching some of that from the pulpit. Instead of telling people that their sin has led them away from God, we're trying to get them to realize that there is some good in them. And we're using psychology from the pulpit. We're talking about management techniques of how to run the church and condition the church. We've used advertisement strategies. We've made it about living life to the fullest when the real background is having church or getting them involved in church we're coming up with drug rehab programs instead of just saying let's get in the altar and pray that demon out of you are y'all hearing me uh, this morning we're trying to have all different secular inroads into the church if we're not careful we try to become like the world to win the world our music programs are becoming like worldly rock and roll shows entertainment has taken its place in the church but the reality is I still believe that what drives men to the foot of the cross is the preaching of the word of God if we have anything I know in our modern day we're wanting teachers in the pulpit soft spoken individuals that'll pat us on the back and tell us how good we live but can I tell you I came by to tell you there ain't one of us me included that's sitting under the the sound of my voice this morning uh, that's worth the powder to blow our brains out had it not been for what Jesus done uh, I heard Jesus say uh, there is none good uh, that includes me and you uh, except our Father which is in heaven I cannot help myself when I was hung up in drugs and alcohol I couldn't bring myself out uh, when I was hung up in lust I couldn't help myself uh, but I heard an old time preacher uh, get up in a pulpit uh, and 
that sing and swing the sword of the word of God. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when I heard that man of God preach the word of God to me, it woke up faith in my heart. And with that faith, I accepted Christ and came out of everything that had me bound. Are y'all with me this morning? I, I know some of it. Listen, I'm not against all this stuff. I, I'm not against uh, praise and worship music. I, I, I'm not against the modern day theology of uh, drama skits to show. In fact, in a couple of weeks, the first Sunday of November, uh, the youth of our church is going to put on a drama here in the church. I'm not against that. I believe that you can use just about anything to wake up the individual's thought pattern uh, to realize that they can have... A better life. But can I tell you, you can't get saved from a song. You can't get saved from a drama skit. You have to get saved through the preaching of the Word of God. For we are begotten by the Word and we are drawn by the Spirit. It takes the Word. And can I tell you, from the very eon of the church age, what has changed men's lives is the preaching of the Word of God. Let me show share the scripture with you Saul has brought 600 men down into the Philistines camp what he did not realize that was around the top of those mountains there was 30,000 chariots 6,000 horsemen and the people looked like the Bible said the sand that is upon the seashore the Philistines had encamped Israel God's chosen people they are in trouble they are in Bondage. The enemy has come against them, came out, sent spoilers into the camp of Israel, and has robbed them of the very things that God has gave them. We are living in a modern day time. Even though we're the people of God, the enemy has encamped us and are sending out spoilers to take away from us the things that God has given to us. And may I say to you, the Philistines gave them in this day uh, they gave them maddox uh, they gave them hoes uh, they gave them forks uh, they gave them axes uh, so that they could be successful in an earthly realm uh, but they would not allow them to have a sword uh, in their hand uh, and if the devil's trying to do anything uh, in these last days uh, it's to take the sword uh, of the word of God uh, out of our hand uh, so we'll not be able to fight uh, can I tell you you won't sing your way through some valleys. You won't do anything. You'll have to have the word of God to bring you through some of the battles we'll face. Yes, yes, yes. The word of God. He, he says to them, uh, come to pass in the day of battle. They, they, had the, they had the forks, the Bible said. They had the mattocks. They had everything they needed to sharpen their culture, their axes and their mattocks and their forks. But the king of the Philistines would not allow them to have a sword or a spear in their hand. He would not allow them to have the very things they needed for the battle. And can I tell you, I am afraid that in our modern day, we are so caught up in having new homes nice cars a better job going up the ladder of success we're more worried about our children going to college than going to the house of God we're more concerned about them going to a ball game than we are them concerned about having them in the altar at the time of prayer I've came by to preach a little while you don't understand that this life is a life full of battles and when you get saved the devil is out after you and you better have in the day of battle something to fight back with a manic won't do you any good a manic digs in the dirt an axe chops down the trees 
things. It's an earthly thing. But when it comes time for the day of battle, you better have something way down deep in you that is moving on the inside, working on the outside to bring you through the battle of life. My God, give me the Word of God. My God, give me the Holy Ghost. Give me the anointing. I want to know tomorrow when I face the battle that I've got a sword in one hand and a spear in the other. I'm not worried about this world. This world's not my home. There was no sword in the people of God's hand. So the devil encamped them. Listen to me. Do you know why the devil fights you so much about coming to Redemption Harvest? I'm going to tell the truth. Because the sword of the word is swung here. I ain't the best preacher in the world. But Pastor Sizemore, I do know I preach the truth. Are y'all hearing me? No matter what has been said about me or what you may think about me or what goes on. I can tell you one thing, I am held accountable to preaching that word. And I am not backwards shy, despondent. I'm not intimidated by any other preacher. I know what is in me. And when I get up to preach, I know how to pull the sword of the word of God out from the pages of that book. And I know how to swing that sword so we can learn to live another battle. Can I tell you, many have fallen around me. Preacher after preacher have quit. But 26 years later, after everything that's been said and done to me, I'm still swinging the sword because I will not allow the devil to only allow me to use a mattock or an axe. I understand the importance of having the word of God deep down in my heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against God. Now let me preach a while. My introduction is done. From the very onset of this Christianity move, from the very book of Acts, the most important thing to those apostles was to preach the word. Let me run down some of them for you right quick. I wrote this down. Listen to this. The first event of church history following the coming of the outpouring of the Spirit of God was Peter's sermon when he stood up in Acts and preached the gospel to them. And the Bible said when the gospel was preached, 3,000 souls were saved that day. The next day in Acts chapter, uh, uh, or the next day, you see Peter preach again and 5,000 souls got saved. By the time you get to Acts chapter 4, verse number 2, it records the displeasure of the Jewish officials that the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. The gospel is nothing more than the good news that Jesus saves, Jesus delivers, Jesus heals, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And if you ever get the sword of the Word of God swinging in those aspects, men will walk out of here victorious. I'm tired of seeing a church defeated swinging in an earthly rim, swinging a manic or swinging an axe, trying to cut one another down or dig up something in the dirt if we quit trying to dig up with a mattock something we know on somebody or quit trying to cut one another down with the axe and throw those tools down and pick up the sword of the word of God we might do something against this kingdom of darkness When you come to Acts chapter two, uh, uh, chapter 4 verse 2. And daily, everybody say daily. They were in the temple and in every house. They ceased not to teach or to preach Jesus Christ. Now y'all say you get enough preaching for me on Sunday morning. Some of you hope I don't preach on Sunday night. Most of you don't come on Wednesday night so you don't have to hear me again. But what about if I came to your house? That's what the scripture said. And daily in the temple and in every house. What if I come over to you and said, Hey, Brother Tom, be prophet. I'm going home with you and your wife today. 
Y'all hear me? First of all, they'd be going, oh, we got anything in the house to cook? Pat, Sister Patsy, you, you cook for the preacher. What if I got there and just got, I mean, walked right in the living room. They sat down and I just stood back up and opened the Bible and said, I'm going to preach to you two. See, we, we're in this time that we don't care for preaching to go out because it's going out to everybody. But what about when that sword comes to your house? What about when the preacher gets involved? Y'all ain't helping me. What about when he's standing in your living room and you can't pawn it off on anybody sitting behind you and you can't shovel it over your shoulder? Uh, what about when there ain't nobody listening but you and your wife? Come on, somebody. What about when the man of God sings, swings the sword in your own house? What about when he corrects you? What about when he says you can't live like that and go to this church? Are y'all hearing me? You can't live like that and sing in the choir. You can't live like that and preach the word of God. You can't live like that and be a deacon. You got to straighten it. What about when the sword comes to your house? Your house. Oh, yeah. After the, listen to this, after the greatest first persecution of the church broke out, it drove those apostles out of that upper room to every city. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 8 verse 4, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Everywhere preaching the word. If they went to the fair, they went preaching the word. Not dressed like somebody inappropriately. What's in your heart shows on your outside. Don't get mad at me, I'm, I'm preaching. You know, y'all know I'm not a dress code preacher. But I do believe a woman or a man ought to dress modestly. Y'all hear me? If they went to the Walmart, they went preaching the word. It wasn't a Walmart back then, I don't reckon. but They went preaching the word. If they went to work, they went preaching the word. How long has it been since you preached to somebody you work with? I'm not talking about telling them what they've done wrong or how they're living. I'm talking about preaching Christ to them. Do you know that the Bible says in Acts chapter 8 it records the preaching of Philip, the preaching of Peter and John to the Samaritans and Philip to the Ethiopian church. By the time you come to Acts chapter 9, the Bible says in straightway uh, Paul preached Christ in the synagogues that he was and is the Son of God. The preaching of the word was so important that was what their life was about. By the time they come to, listen to this, all the way through the book of Acts, all the way to the very last verse, Acts records how the early church continued to preach the gospel. Get this, Acts chapter 28 verse 31. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding them. All the way through the book of Acts, their constant goal was preaching the gospel. But what happened in the book of Acts? Lame men sitting at the gate of the temple got healed. The dead got raised. Life was put back in people. Miracle after miracle, signs, wonders, and miracles followed those men that preached the gospel. Why? Because they sung good? No, because they preached the gospel. They, sung, they swung the sword of the Word of God. Listen to this. The early church's emphasis on preaching reflected that our Lord, our own our Lord, and at the very outset of His ministry, they preached Christ and Him crucified. They didn't get hung up on any other thing. They preached Christ and Him crucified. What's going to free men and women today of all this drug addiction? I don't know how sick you are of it, but I am sick of all this drug addiction. Of suicides and overdoses. I'm tired of preaching funerals or attending funerals where young men 20 years of age have took their life because they're hung up on drugs. Are y'all hearing me this morning? And our programs, are, are all the things we're coming up with ain't going to change that. What's going to change it is the preaching of the Word. Listen to this, I'm, I'm about done. Did you know that preaching the Word of God 
has held the central place in the life of the church throughout the ages. Get this for a minute. The Reformation, which recovered our faith back to America and spread largely through the revival by the preaching of men like Martin Luther. When he nailed the thesis to the Catholic Church and said the just shall live by faith. And he started what what history says was the reformation of the saints. Men like Calvin and Knox that preached this gospel. And then at the very core of the great strength of the uh, 17th century, the Puritan century. Its emphasis was on sound Bible preaching. The great awakening of the 18th century was led through preaching by men by the name of George Whitefield, John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards that so greatly preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. Preach messages like that. The 19th century saw great evangelists like D.L. Moody and great preachers such as Charles Spurgeon, Joseph Parker, and Alexander McLaren. And may I say, in this modern day, We've got great men of God preaching this gospel. All of these men were dedicated to the preaching of the word of God. Nothing else mattered. One man quoted this, said this, and I'll quote it. A godly man gifted with the spirit to preach the word has no equal. Let me say that again. A godly man gifted by the spirit of God to preach the word has no equal. Jerry's dad, last Sunday they rushed Jerry's mom to the hospital and I went to the hospital uh, for just a few moments, maybe an hour or two, and, and sat with Jerry's family. And his dad's a pastor and this is what his dad said. He said to me, Jody, the greatest calling on the face of the earth is not to be the President of the United States. It is to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preaching the Word is God's ordained method for evangelism and edification for the church. It is God's ordained method. And the weakness of this modern day church is largely due to the decline of powerful preaching. Several years ago I was a young man in in ministry. I'm not as young now and I feel that. When I first started, I started, I started preaching very early. And uh, along about the age of 19 or 20, I had an older man tell me this. He said, Jody, whatever you do in life, don't ever stop preaching the Word of God. And I said, what I don't plan on. He said, no, you don't get what I'm saying. Don't become a teacher. Don't become soft-spoken. Preach the word. The word preach means to proclaim with passion. Now I know my style of preaching ain't for everybody. Some people don't like to be talked loud to. I'm not talking loud to you. I'm passionate about what I'm preaching. I believe it with everything in me or I would quit. I mean it's in me. I eat, live, breathe this stuff. I wake up in the middle of the night, pick my Bible up and read for hours because it's in me. It's in me. So don't take it that I'm screaming at you. I've seen them sitting in the congregation then put their fingers in their ears. Little kids go, I can't stand that. They don't understand the passion behind it. I'm going I'm to leave you with one, one, one scripture. Found in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse number 1. Through verse number 4, Paul is telling Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, everybody say now, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. We are living in those times. Now here's where I want to put my emphasis on this scripture. As long 
as the Philistines could keep the sword and the spear out of the Israelites' hand, they had them captive. Listen to me for a minute. The scripture I read you said none of the Israelites had a sword in their hand except for Saul and Jonathan. Saul was king. Can I preach and tell you that the king still has a sword in his hand? How do the Israelites get the sword? They depend on the king to win the battle for them. They go into battle him swinging the sword. Don't ever go against the man of God that swings the sword. Touch not my anointed. Do my prophets no harm. The sword they swing, can I tell you this? Will either cut sin out of your life or it will cut you asunder. That sword comes to divide. That sword is the only offensive weapon you have in your armor. If you can't fight back in this battle of faith, you'll lose. Can I tell you this and I'll close? Jesus was baptized in the river of Jordan by John straightway come up out of the water and was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The devil said, see these stones? Israel's starving to death. Your people, the apple of your eye, they're starving to death. Command these stones to be made bread. Love your people enough to feed them, is what he was really saying. Jesus was tempted by love. The devil said, Turn these stones to bread, feed your people. Jesus turned around and said, it is written. What did he do, Jerry? Pastor Jerry, he picked up the sword. It is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What was he saying? I'm going to give them a bread that's greater than the bread that feeds their flesh. He takes him to a mountain. If you'll bow down to me, Satan said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. That devil didn't know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You know what Jesus does? It is written. Thou shall not bow down. Y'all get it? He takes him to the pinnacle of the temple. Thrust yourself off. Here's what will happen. If you say you're king, when you thrust yourself off, the devil said, the word of God said... See, the devil knows how important the sword is for you. He said the word of God said that before your foot could dash against a stone, the angels of God would bear thee up. Jesus grabbed the sword and said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He used the sword of the word of God to overcome temptation. You want to win a battle? Pick your Bible up. Open the pages of it. Start reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about all those miracles and get it in your head. If he can do it for them men, he can do it for me. Read the book of Acts. How he empowered the apostles to preach the word of God and see signs, miracles, and wonders following. Realize your family doesn't have to be what they are. They can be greater. We can have a future. We can love one another. We can fight this fight of faith together. I wonder, in that scripture, did you know Paul only had, or Saul only had 600 men with him? And there was 30,000 chariots in the army of the Philistines. That battle looked too big for Saul. It wouldn't have been big at all if he had a sword in all of his men's hands. And the Spirit of God would have used that sword to defeat the devil. 
Until you realize the importance of having this sword in your hand, the devil will keep robbing you of the things God wants for your life. Everybody say, preach on, preacher. How many believes I've preached this morning? Truth. 